Ronald Preston Cock in the building. Ronald, it's a pleasure. But you know what? How did we first meet? Let's let's start from there. Cause I I I I'm fuzzy about this story. Could could you take me down memory lane? How did we first meet? Was it Brothers with Ties? Was it Brothers with Ties? It might have been Brothers. It might have been Brothers with Ties. At, at least I know I heard about you through Brothers with Ties. Right. Um, and then we just started landing in the same circles, and you know, uh, iron sharpens iron, and real recognize real. So we just started kind of checking in with each other. And I think the first time we officially worked together was when I invited you to Morse to speak to my ah, kids. Ah, yeah. I think that was the first time. Yeah, that was the first time we really. Yeah, I just had a yeah. memory. I remember seeing you before Brothers with Ties. We hadn't officially met, but it was at Queen Bee's uh, for a poetry thing. And I don't know how I got to that poetry thing. I'm not sure if it was Nate or somebody else, but that's how I, I that's why I first saw you, but we didn't meet. We didn't officially meet there. Brothers with Ties was firstly oh, okay. but I just like short jogging down yeah. the memory lane. That's, that's how uh, uh, like, I was like, man, I like this brother. I, li- I like what he's doing. <laughs> um, it's it's funny how san diego works with the black community because um if you're doing something you're eventually going to run into each other like it's just i mean because there's there's a certain group of people there's a certain number of people who are active in in various forms so whether you meet immediately or down the road you're going to meet simply because you're active and so it, it was destiny for it to go down. You know what, too? That is no lie, because there was a couple of times your name had came up when I was doing Connected Careers back when I was at San Diego Workforce Partnership. And I was trying to do, uh, I was putting some youth programs together. And then the, there's two people that told me like, yo, you know, you really need to connect with Ronald with what you're doing. Um, but they didn't have your direct line. So I was like, like, who's Ronald? Mm-hmm. How do I get a hold of him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because uh, that that's happened with 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 Jordan. Um, that's happened with uh, uh, with Jelani. Uh, like we, uh, Eric. It's it's just funny how you know all of us who now associate with each other um, at the highest level. How we ended up finding out about each other. Like with Jordan, for those who don't know, who I'm referring to uh, Jordan Jerome Harrison, who is probably the greatest man in the history of San yes, Diego. Yes. Um, Mr. VP, Jordan, Mr. He, VP, uh, put some, put some <laughs> oomph on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so, the first, so the first time I ever saw Jordan was he introduced Matthew Gordon uh-huh. at a Blue Heart breakfast. Yeah. And I guess, I don't know if Matthew was speaking or or went getting an award or something. Um, but Jordan spoke and I was like, okay, this brother's, this brother's just introducing somebody and he's dynamic. And so, um, so I was like, okay, that's the first time I saw him. Then I ran into him again at a reality changers fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time we actually yeah. talked and he was getting ready. He was preparing to go to Harvard. And I was like, cause I thought that because he introduced Matthew, I thought he was in nah, politics. He far from it. I didn't know he was. Edu- I didn't know he was in education. So once I did reality changes and found out he was in ed- education, I was like, "Oh, okay, me and this brother got a rock." And and ever since then, we've been building the friendship, and now that's my brother. So it's funny how those those connections happen just being in that's the community. Beautiful. That's beautiful. That's uh, beautiful. And Joy was like his reality change was just like one floor down, but I didn't really like start rocking with or hanging out and connecting with Jordan. So after I left workforce partnership, cause he wasn't there yet or if he was in some capacity, but like, not like he is now. Right. <laughs> so man, funny how life works. Yeah. So man, I, I, I have a hard time pinning you down in one job or one career because even though you're an educator, you're, you're in a lot of you're in a couple of different lanes and spaces. How would you how would you describe your career right now as we speak? <laughs> um, I I oftentimes refer to myself as a writer who teaches, not a teacher who writes. Okay. And so uh, at my heart and at my soul, I'm a writer. Okay. But the best form of um, giving back to the community is teaching. Yes. And so. In order to be all encompassing, in order to still work with words, in order to still work with the youth, in order to still work within education, mm-hmm. and teaching provides that platform. And um, I wanted to make sure that I was always in a space where I'm giving back. Yeah. Um, I never wanted to be in a job that took me mm-hmm. away from that because I'm at my best when I'm in those settings. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah, I, I just consider myself a, a teacher 
a teacher slash writer, um, more so educator slash writer, because teaching is a job. Education is a way of life. Ooh. And so, um, that, and so being in, <laughs> I said teaching is a job, but education is a way of life. Ooh, right. And so, and, and so you can be an educator in various spaces uh, and not just teaching um, ment- mentorship, um, nonprofit, uh, um, community, whatever it is that you're working within, um, you can be educating others in that space. Uh, financial advisors and and mental health professionals, all those people are educators. It's just that the name is just different, but they're all under that educator model. And so, so I take it very seriously. Like I, I'll I'll be in class with my kids, and we might not actually do anything from the actual lesson plan that day. And they might learn more in that class than they would on a lesson plan day, mm. just because we're having life, just because we're having life lesson conversations, just because they're picking my brain and I'm asking them questions, and we're just having dialogue that enhances their ability to critically think. To me, that's sometimes that's more important. Yeah. And there's there's even times where my kids will take advantage of that because I'll never forget I was a I was at Gompers Prep in um, San Diego, and I was in an eighth grade science class as a sub, and um. I had I had a plan for the day or whatever, and one of my kids asked me a question, and I was like, "You really want to know that?" And he was like, "He was like, yeah, Mr. Clark, can you can you, can you talk about that?" I was like, "All right, sure." Forty five minutes, forty five fifty minutes pass. We still talking about it or whatever, and I'm like, "Okay, y'all. Uh, I guess we're not gonna get that uh, get to today's lesson." Um, but that that was a good conversation, and I look at him and he kind of smiles, and I was like, "You planned that, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "Man." He said, I didn't feel like doing any work today, Mr. Clark, because I knew if I asked you a question, you would just start talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, they, so, they, so they knew how I was. They knew I loved a life lesson day. And I was like, touche, young man, touche. You, you know your teacher. You know your teacher well enough to know that if you ask me a good enough question, then I'll just, I'll just start rating. <laughs> so, but, but, that's, but, that's, but that's the beauty of working with the youth. Look, though, look, you know, he educated you're, you're, you're you never on bored. He educated you on something that day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he told me that day. I was like, I, I love it though. Like that's that's part you of. Yeah, I, I really do. love that you mentioned that because I, I remember being invited to speak at an educators panel, and it was all like traditional educators in pre K and uh, college, middle school, and and I was like, I was, and this person who was holding the panel wasn't educator by trade, and I was like, um. I'm not sure how the other people are going to feel because I'm not a traditional educator. Like, I'm not, tra- she's like, I consider you an educator because of everything you've done in these spaces and what you're doing with these kids and even what you've done for some teachers. And I was like, okay. I, it's like, just, I just know by, you know, just the, the literal, like, academic, academia world, like, how I'm not viewed as an educator in their eyes. So I, I love that you, you put that out in the universe. Uh, the difference between teaching and education. So thank you for that. Uh, now, how did you get into writing? Uh, like, actually, before you get into the writing story, what was your first job? Just out of curiosity. I always like asking people that question. I like, <laughs> I like for people to see that, you know, one, it's not where you start, it's where you finish, right? And then also there's probably lessons that you learned from your first job. Yeah. So tell me about your first job, what's some good lessons you learned that probably carry to you through life right now? And then we can talk about how you got it. Uh, my first job out of college or my first, first job? job, job. Like my first, first time job. Been- job. We, we take it. Where are you back? My first paid job was um, Foot Locker what? in Chula Vista. Uh, I could have got me yeah. some discounts. Um, yeah. No, what's funny about it is uh, when you talk about lessons. So I got it because I volunteered through DECA, which was a uh, organization I was a part of in high school. Mm-hmm. We volunteered at the NFL Experience when the Super Bowl was there, mm-hmm. and so we volunteered with the Foot Locker with the Foot Locker portion. Yeah. So because I had that volunteer experience and I did and I sold really well while I was there, I ended up getting the spot in nice. Chula Vista. So, so I get to Chula Vista, and I think he put me on schedule maybe four days in three months. Um, I don't know why, I don't know what his issue was with me or what the situation was, but he just wasn't giving me hours. I wasn't even in the system. I was still writing down my, my hours. So the th- one of the things I learned was make sure you're in the actual system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so time moved on. He wasn't giving me any hours. So I actually got another job at KB Toys okay. in Mission Valley. Um, 
started working there. They gave me tons of hours. I was working during Christmas break, gave me a ton of hours during that time. And then I ended up meeting the lady, the lady, the lady footlocker manager, because my best friend worked there. Uh, the lady for locker manager in Mission Valley. Mm -hmm. Because I was in the system in Chula Vista, because I was part of Chula Vista, I could work at Lady Foot Locker. And so she started giving me hours over there and I started slanging. Uh And so I started slanging, um, but I'm only going over there when when other people don't need to work. So I'm slanging, slanging, slanging. Um, KB Toys ends. I basically just start working over at Lady Foot Locker whenever they, you know, whenever they ask me. And eventually... Because uh, my best friend would tell me at, uh, at school, in high school, he would tell me in school, yo, somebody's missing today. Can you come in? I'd be like, bet. Because I had to catch a trolley and stuff. I didn't have no cell phone. Like, I was, it was real good. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so one day he comes up to me. He's like, yo, why didn't you go to work yesterday? And I was like, you didn't tell me I had to go? And he was like, yo, you're on the schedule. I was like, wait, what? So they basically hired me based off of the the few days I had been I had been there. Wow. Um, and the and yeah, and the manager goes to Chula Vista and to pick up my paperwork and tells dude like uh, and dude's like, oh, so how's he doing? And is a black woman is a black woman who who took me under and she was like, oh, he's in the top ten among part timers uh, in the county for uh, in selling. But thank you, <laughs> and, and walks out. <laughs> yeah, and what's crazy is. I hadn't gotten paid from Chula Vista yet. My older sister walks into the store and goes, um, where's Carlos? <laughs> I need to pay Carlos. Um, you need to pay my brother. Like my sister, like, and what's funny was I was on the floor at the time when she walked in. I was like, but my sister got me paid though. I got paid like two days later. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, yeah. So the learning experience, the learning from that was simply make sure you in the system. Make sure you you speak up for yourself. Make sure you own like, yo, we need to be doing this properly, and and me not working for free. Yeah. Um, but also the learning process was when you do good work, when you do good work, good people will find you. Nice, it. yeah. Because the woman at the woman at Lady Footlocker, she only was letting me work simply because she just got to know me through my best friend. Yeah. And so when she and so she gave me a couple of trial runs, I went in there and did what I did, you know, and was slanging and. I, I ended up working there. Full, I ended up working there, and I ended up being yep, my part time job. So I went from Chula Vista. Yeah. So in a three month, three four month span, it went from Chula Vista Foot Locker to KB Toys to Lady Foot Locker, and Lady Foot Locker ended up being my high school. I love that. School. I love that story. So, so, so now let's fast forward. How did you get into writing? When did that? When did that start to take place? So I, I've always been a big reader, and I tell writers all the time: if you don't read, you're not going to be able to write. There are people who do write yes. and do write fairly well who don't read a lot. But there's a there's a plateau that you, that you end up hitting because you're not you're not analyzing other people's work, you're not looking at other people's work. So I've been so I've been reading my whole life, and I started writing like really early, like um, maybe first grade, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just something that I love to do. Yeah. But you know, I just kind of played I just kind of played around with it or whatever. Then my senior year in high school, this is the moment where I truly tell people that this is when I began writing. And when my senior year in high school, I was in. Um, my 12th grade uh, English class with um, one of my favorite teachers, Miss Madden. And she, and she gave us an assignment where we had to start, we had to write the first few lines at, for the beginning of a book, but we had to get right into it. Um, it wasn't like, you know, the slow, you know, beginning that you normally would have with a book. So uh, I wrote my two or three lines about a girl losing her virginity. Mm. And, yeah, and uh, I read it in class. Um, and I read it with my head down, and when I pull my head up, it's just nothing but just jaws dropped like all over the room. And I was like, "Okay, it, it was was it it was good?" And she was like, "Yes." She was like, "Can you can you make that longer?" Like she wanted to see where I would take it. And I was like, "Yeah." And I was she was like, "I'll give you extra credit if you write if you finish that and bring it to class." I was like, "Oh, bet." And so I ended up writing this one page short story called "Our Eyes Met." And it was basically the, the the day leading up to the the virginity loss, and so so I write this one page or whatever it's real. You know, I, it's funny when I read when I look at it now. It's like I, I can see what I was trying to do as a writer. I just didn't know how right. to do as a writer yet. I write that she loves it, and I end up writing like three or four little short stories like that for her class for extra credit. And so when I leave there, when I leave high school to go to college, I get in part of this group called Spark One, which is basically all the yeah. poets on campus. I, 
I was the curveball because I had short stories. So I'm writing these short stories or whatever. And all my poet friends kept going, bruh, if you strip the language of your short stories, you're writing narrative poems. And I was like, okay. So I started to kind of dive into the poetry and started working at the poetry. And that's why I became a narrative poet because I came from short stories and I just turned those torrid stories into poems while still telling Ooh. stories. And so, so I become a, so I started writing my poems and, um, my junior year was the first year, my junior year in college at Hampton, um, uh, was the first time I actually memorized a poem. And still to this day, my favorite line I've ever written in a poem is from that, is from that poem. It goes, uh, um, as our words intertwine and our hearts crisscross Christ christened our combination, the second coming of Adam and Eve, because there's so much alliteration in there. There's so much, there's, there's just the rhythm. I just love that line. And, um, and so I, I, so I memorized that. Going on in that and line. then, yeah, there's a lot going on in that line. And what's crazy is that I, I wrote that poem for an HIV event we had on campus. Uh-huh. And so the poem itself is about a young man who, who sleeps with a woman, not realizing that that woman had just received the HIV virus from someone else. And in order to pay it to basically as a form of payback, she gave wow. it to somebody else. And so, and so this whole cycle. And so, um, so I wrote it for that. And then, um, our senior year, I became part of this group called the yeah. left side poets. It was about eight or nine of us. And we ended up publishing a book in 2011 that one uh, called the left side poets present strange fruit. Oh, so you wrote a book um, before you wrote a and, book. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. This is a poetry. This is a collective poetry book called the left side poets present strange fruit. And we actually won a national underground spoken word poetry award for poetry book of the year. Nice. And so, so that happened, so that happened in 2011. Um, but so my degrees in journalism, I don't know if you knew that, that but not. my degrees in journalism. So I was, I, I was headed to ESPN. Uh-huh. Like that's that was my original route. That, that's um, what my that's what my, my mentor works were, at right now. Okay, that's what's up. Yeah, my, one of my best, one of my best friends works for the S, uh, for the right. SEC network, and so um, so I was doing all the journalism stuff. I was in three nationally recognized programs in college. I had three internships. Um, I wrote for MLB dot com. Like I was doing really big things. Uh, moved to New Jersey after college. Worked for a newspaper out there for three years. But while I was there, I fell out of mm. love with journalism. Uh, I didn't like the, the 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 day-to-day grind and the nitty-gritty stuff. I didn't it, it took away a lot of my creativity. Yeah. And so in the midst of that, I started falling in love with screenwriting. And so I wrote like three or four scripts while I was in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um and I moved back to California in 2011 not to teach, not for poetry. I moved back for screenwriting. Mm. And I got and, and I ended up going to the UCLA um professional program in screenwriting for a year. Uh, my screenplays have been read by, uh, by Michael B. Jordan, um, Ava DuVernay, um, Sally Richardson Whitfield, Regina King, Journey Smollett. Like I've had some pretty that's, heavy names touch my stuff. And one of my screenplays was supposed to be produced by Isaiah Washington. Ooh, I can't um, wait for before, that. Yeah, before he lost his mind. Um, I can't rock with him now because of his old situ- him being oh. a Trump supporter. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But, uh, but uh but yeah so like so i did journalism i did the journalism um i did the, I, I was on the 2013 elevated slam team that finished fourth in the country uh um and then i hosted my own open mic lyrical exchange for four years and so i was always in this i was always in this creative space always in this writing space mm-hmm. but nothing had popped off at the level that i that i thought i could pop off at like i had i had chances i, I, I had things that were kind of kind of working out or getting close, but I was just getting close, but not getting over that hump. Yeah. It wasn't until I wrote the book. It wasn't until I wrote Vinny a love letter. Um, did I truly find myself exactly where I was supposed yeah, to be as a writer? Vinny, Vinny was a, a great, a great story. Great testimony. I'm glad those words, there's a lot of uh, people that I, I've, I've ran into that read your book and said how much has impacted their life. So, um, the relationship oh, yeah. that, you know, us as men have, you know, sometimes I see a little bit of Vinny and myself uh, with my relationship with my pops growing up. You know what I'm saying? There's little pieces in there that just speaks to me like, ooh, I, I felt that one. <laughs> yeah. 
and the thing that I and the thing the thing that I want to tell young people is that the journalism, screenwriting, and poetry, all three of them feed into each other to help me write my prose. And so every experience that you have as a professional, as a creative, as a person feeds into future experiences. That's why they call it experience because I, I could not have written Vinny at 25. I didn't, I hadn't gone through what I needed to go through yet. I hadn't developed yet. I hadn't matured yet. My growth hadn't, hadn't occurred, hadn't occurred at the, at the rate that it needed to at, by, at 25. But, at, it, it, but at the age that I wrote it, mm-hmm. Oh, I had a man that last 64% of that book. I was in pain, bro. I was in pain. I had, uh, a relation, I had a relationship that ended, and I was and I was mourning a miscarriage. So I was, I had, I just needed something. Needed to, I needed somewhere to put yeah. that energy. And, and you know, they 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 often say that pain often produces the best work too. Uh, I'm not sure what it is about it, but it, it, I, I would say yes, it does. Now, here's what I want to dive into because. I mean, your your career in writing is not the typical career we often see. Uh, well, I want to say typical, because I'm like, I hate to say typical, but uh, like the pathway that you took is is very unique, right? Um, and, and somebody looking at it is like, oh man, I got to do all that to become a writer, I, and and I, I don't want them to feel that way. Like, I, I guess what what some advice w- would you give to someone who would like to s- start a career? um as a writer or in your industry like like what what advice would you give them now that you've you've been in it in several different spaces like like what what would be your 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 advice read with the intent to learn uh is my first thing uh a lot of times, I mean, most of the time when we pick up a book, we pick up a magazine or we pick up a screenplay or whatever it is we're reading, we're reading for information or we're reading for entertainment. Those are usually the two reasons why we're reading is either for info or for entertainment. When you're reading for craft, when you're reading to study, it's a different kind mm-hmm. of reading. So when I'm reading James Baldwin, I'm paying attention to his syntactical structure. I'm paying attention to his diction. I'm paying attention to his uh, use of punctuation. I'm paying attention to his dialogue. Like I'm actually analyzing his craftsmanship. It's like if you're a basketball player and you're watching a basketball game, some people are going to watch it simply for the score and the dunks. But if you're a hooper, you're like, oh, that backdoor cut was nasty. Oh, his in and out was nasty. Oh, that step back. Like you're paying attention to, oh, they're open at the elbow. Oh, they ran the triangle. Oh, they ran the motion offense. Like you're paying attention to, to the nuances of the, of the craft. You're looking at the game, the game within the game. So as a writer, you have to read for the craft and, and read bad writing and read good writing read because you need to know writing. what those two things are. Like. Read bad writing because when it, because if you notice bad writing, when you're writing badly, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're able to recognize it, right? Like uh, prime example, um, uh, uh, one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of Tyler Perry is because he literally said out of his mouth that he doesn't take criticism. And there were criticisms of, from Spike Lee, from Robert Townsend, from like different people who he should have been listening to. Uh-huh. And so I can tell just from him saying that is that he doesn't read other people's work or look at other people's work because if he did, he'd recognize his was bad. So it, it's it's always you have to read bad writing, you have to read good writing in order to recognize, you know, what those things are. But reading, I tell people all the time, yo, if you don't read, yo, like you need to know what what it looks like to craft sentences, to tell stories, to put together story structure, to write dialogue. You have to do those things. Like I, I read Baldwin is the goat. James Baldwin is the greatest right. writer to ever walk. And I don't and, think I don't think he's and I fully like, appreciated for his rights. I, I think I think people isn't. don't even fully grasp what they're reading at times uh, and and understand like what it took mm-hmm. to put put that together, that body of work. <laughs> yeah. So you find your favorite writers. Like my my Mount Rushmore is Baldwin, Tony Morrison. Juno Diaz and Tim O'Brien with uh, Colson Whitehead is looking to take a spot because um, he's the best novelist in the country right now to me. And then Tana Coates is just Mr. Coates. He's just amazing. 
Um, but those are the people that if somebody reads my writing and then tells me that they see one of them in my writing, that's one of the best compliments you can get. And that's happened to me. Like I've had people say they saw Morrison, they saw Baldwin, they saw Diaz, like in my style, but it's still no. my style. And that's, and, but if it, if it wasn't for me reading from those greats, from those people who've mastered their craft, then I wouldn't be the writer that I am because the best writers steal right. from the best writers. So now let's so. take it even a step simpler. Like um, what advice would you give to somebody? Because what I, one thing that you've done that I really, really love and admire is that you've been able to um, take your pain and, 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 and put it into purpose by crafting this beautiful story. Um, and that's something I hope to do in my lifetime. I, I'm not looking to be a, a world renowned writer, but I've I've had some pain and traumas in my life that I've I've some of it I've overcame and some of it I'm, I'm still in the midst of uh, overcoming. But at some point I I want to put that into like some literature, or some writing, and, and give the lesson to the people. Right? How do you begin to even do that and unpack that? Because um, I, I feel like that's an emotional process, and to be able to pin that down and then do it in a structural way for people to let people in to, to, so they get that feeling and also they get the lesson from it too. Woo. Like, how do you do that? Um, it, it honestly comes back to self-reflection, transparency and accountability. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you have to be to write from pain. You have to acknowledge that you're in pain. Uh, a lot of people don't even do the acknowledgement process. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, I'm good. Oh, I'm fine. I was not good. I was not okay. And I was not mm-hmm. fine. Uh, and, and my friends and family knew that. And my friends and family also understood that me writing my book was my therapy. Mm-hmm. It was my, it, uh, it was very cathartic for me. And uh, going through that process and just, and, and, channeling that type of energy into that one project uh, was necessary. I, I often tell people, I said, uh, I was scared to write my second book because I, w- I, I was worried that I was going to be Mary J. Blige. <laughs> and, and they were like, what do you mean? I said, Mary's best music was when she was in pain. I don't like Happy Mary. I don't like her music when she's happy. She's not the same Good. artist. And... With no more drama, like no, I want more drama. Like I need you to be, I need you to date KC. I need you to be, I need you to be in a terrible situation. But because, but because I wrote Vinny in so much pain, and now I'm happy. Now I'm in this great emotional space, this great mental space, and I and I'm I I, I love who I am. Right? I I'm, I was worried. I'm like, dang, am I going to be able to create at the level that I did with this last uh-huh. book? Um. If I'm not in the same mental space. And so with the second book, I have to focus on the craft yeah. itself and not, and not the emotion of it, uh, itself. The first book was very raw. This one's going to be much more strategic mm. um, in, what, in what I plan on doing. So I, I just tell anyone, like if you're it, it, uh, one, of my, one, of, one of our dear friends in, in, in the community in San Diego, uh, uh, Brisa, um, Brisa Johnson, she just dropped um, her first solo music project, and oh, her Bree lyrics Blue, you can Bree feel. Blue Bree. Blue. No, 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 Bri- uh, no, 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 no. That, that's a diff- okay. that's a different girl. Um, yeah, different one, different what, one. But no, but Brisa, Brisa, Brisa oh, Lauren, okay. Brisa Lauren. She, uh, she, yeah, she just dropped her first um, solo project called uh, um, "In Her Stillness," and lyrically, bruh, like you talk about just digging deep and telling stories. And the, I think the, the beauty of writing from pain, it, because we're humans, somebody is going to feel it. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as singular pain. No one person is, is the only person to go through what they've gone through. And so when you're writing, even though you're writing for yourself, someone somewhere is going to find something in yeah. it. And that's what Br- Brisa got dudes over there in their feelings because they're still feeling what she's writing and she's writing it from a woman's perspective. Like, no, for real. Like it's, it, it's my sister loves her, loves her songs because she's speaking to her. Right. And that was 
and that was Brees's way of getting through what she was going Ooh. through. And so with me and Vin, and so with me and Vinny, that was me getting through what I, I, I absolutely roast Capricorns in Vinny. Why? Because the person I who caused my pain at the time was a Capricorn. So I went off on Capricorns. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I, I had to, I had to do it. And so and so it's this it's this it's this it's this. But it was there. It was therapy for me because instead of me causing pain, causing others mm-hmm. pain. In order to heal, because a lot of times, because hurt exactly. people hurt people, right? In order for me not to hurt others, I had to put all that hurt and all that pain into a safe space, which was my book. And by doing so, I now end up with a book that just placed in October in the 28th annual Writer's Digest self-published book awards. And so 1,800 books were submitted into the, into the competition in nine categories. And I'm one of the ones that was selected. So it's clearly that pain was for a reason. Mm. And so now I'm able to continue with my career without even having to write in that pain anymore. Um, but knowing what I'm capable of because of the pain. And that's why I'm okay but, with the pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, that was, that was deep right there. Um, you had to connect me to homegirl too now, because now that that's on my radar. <laughs> well, I, I'll absolutely send you the link. You can see it. Her stuff is on YouTube, Spotify, where everything you got, she got her, her she got her stuff on there, and like I, I keep her in rotation. She's a, a beautiful, awesome, intelligent woman um, who works in the community in right. San Diego. Um, real vibrant, real vibrant, a lot of energy, amazing on stage. She's the lead singer for for Lyrical Groove as well, um, and so yeah, with Kendrick Dow, and so like yeah, so she she's absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of her for this project because you could just feel. And me being somebody who writes from pain, I could feel hers. And I was like, okay, I see, I see, I see see where where you went. went. I see where you went. Now, so, um, you know, you're, you're heavy in the writing industry, working on Vinny too. What what do you think the future has in store for the, the, the writing industry? And what does this space look like in in the future as we start to really connect with more, uh, black writers, uh, and and get to hear their stories? What, What do you see? What, what's interesting is the pandemic and an agent I was speaking to um, told me this. She said during this pandemic, the one group of published writers that is actually benefiting from the pandemic are writers of color. Mm. Why? Why? Because more of us are actually sitting down. More of us are actually in our homes. More of us are actually looking for things to do. And so without having the access to a lot of the things we previously did, we're getting back to reading. And so she said, this is a great time to be a black writer, to be a, a writer of color. Due to the, the many, 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 many fights that our creators have had behind the scenes in the film and TV industry, you're getting more and more of our images on screen. Mm-hmm. And the only person who has a blank page is the writer. Producers, directors, actors, everybody gets a finished script. Yeah. The only person that has a blank page is the, is the writer. And I think that as time has progressed, writers are getting more respect. When we had the writer strike a few years ago, yeah. and actors and actresses were just almost in tears, like, can y'all please like, take care of this? Because we need our writers. Because you don't work without the writers. You don't work without us. You don't. The backbone of the industry. I don't care what anybody says. You can't direct no words. And so you can try. People have. but And they fail miserably. You, you, need we, you can and, tell when the writers were gone for some yeah, shows. Because oh. like, this, oh, this ain't even the same show. Like, what is this? Yeah, I'm like, that character, that character <laughs> wouldn't say that. And so writing is always going to be here. It's always been here. You have different ways in which it shows up now. Because, you know, them little TikTok videos and stuff, that takes writing. These web series on YouTube, writing. I tell my kids who play video games all the time that the little mini movies they have at the beginning of these RPGs and stuff, somebody wrote the script for that. Somebody writes everything, everything we enjoy when it comes to entertainment, literature, whatever, somebody had to write. Yeah. And so when you, so all you have to do is decide if you want to enter the industry, which part of the industry you want to enter, then you find mentors or at least people to look up to from afar. Mm-hmm that are in those industries and then you listen and then you listen. I got mentors 
in journalism, poetry, screenwriting, and prose. Mm. And the first three, I got heavy hitters on my list. Like, monsters in the game that, like, people were like, wait, you talk to who? <laughs> yeah, 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 Jamil Hill was my big sister. Like, that was the whole yeah. Like, that was one of my big, that was one of my big supporters of my career. I've written for Jim Rome, or or attempted to. Uh, I, me and Chris Broussard have had lunch. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, me and Mark, Mark Spears has gotten me into a club. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I was headed to ESPN. When I left that industry, you know, some of them stayed with me. Some of them didn't. It is what it is. But I always found a way to get myself in front of people. And I opened my mouth. Closed mouth, exactly. don't get fed. Exactly. And, and I, I had issues with some people because some people thought I talked too much. But I was like, bruh, nobody's going to know me if I don't speak. Exactly. And I'm not going to get the information that I need if I don't speak. And also, I tell people that all the time. Yeah, and I'm, at the time I was five, six, a buck twenty-five. Nobody's <laughs> going to talk to me. <laughs> I was telling somebody the other day. I said, people, I, I, I'm now five, six, a buck forty, and I've been called intimidating by people. It's not because of my stature. It's not because of how how I'm physically in the room. It's my presence in that room. It's my voice in that room. It's my intellect in that room. It's my sense of humor in that room. I had to use my voice in order to fill up space because my stature didn't fill up the space for me. Yeah. And I wasn't going to have anybody approaching me or want to talk to me if that wasn't the case. So I had to take some losses because of that. And I'm very aware and understanding of those losses mm-hmm. I had to take. But I had to do what I needed to do in order to get myself in front of certain people, you know, and now I have a national network that I can tap into at any point in time because I spoke up in in every environment that I was in. If I was in a program and it was four days, everybody in that program over those four days was going to at least talk to me once. You were going to remember me. You were going to remember me. I don't see it as a loss. You know, and if it was a loss, it wasn't a loss on your part. Like everybody plays a role and that's the role they were meant to play in your life, whether it be inspiration, admiration or just a a bystander or hater, whatever role they playing. Let them play their role so that you can play your role. (laughs) Absolutely. So uh, what projects are you currently working on and where can people find you? Um, Literally working on book number two. Okay, tell me about that. Uh, working on um, the sequel to technically the sequel to Vinny, but it's it's more uh-huh. so a standalone. But it has the Vinny story in it. It's called "I Love You, Walter." It originally was going to drop uh, in 2021, but I signed with a literary agent uh, just recently. Congrats on the literary agent! Congrats on the award! Flowers to you, brother! Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I signed with a literary agent. So my next book won't come out for probably another year and a half, two years, uh, because that's just how the publishing business works. Uh, But it will be I Love You, Walter. The thing that can be supported now is in February, uh, maybe March. I'm hoping for February, but it's just COVID's going to make determine a lot. But I'm going to be dropping the second edition of Vinny, a love letter. Going to have a new cover, going to have new acknowledgements, a couple people taken out, some people added. It'll also have the judges' comments from the contest. Uh, it will be in the book. Uh, oh, go ahead. Tell, tell the people the award you won now. Don't, don't stop being modest on me. Tell them the award you won. I, 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 I mentioned, I mentioned oh, it you, earlier, oh, but okay. uh, well, I, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was able to win uh, or place uh, in the honorable mention category for the 28th annual Writer's Digest Self-Published Book Awards. It was 1,800 books submitted. I was selected amongst the top in the mainstream literary fiction category. That was just, <laughs> that was a, a, a major, major yeah. event for me. Gave me a lot of vindication, a lot of um, understanding that like, it wasn't just people who knew me who were supportive of the book. It was people who had no emotional connection to me whatsoever who still who still rocked with it. Yeah. So the primary reason for the, the re-release of the book is that they gave me one of those little award seals that you can put on the front of a book. Oh, nice. so, it said, so it says 2020 Self-Published Book Awards Honorable Mention. It's going to be on the front. It's cool because, you know, people all talk about like, oh, I got the first edition of this book. So now people who have video already and we've sold over. I think we just passed 815 copies in the last two years. Uh, people who have the first book now have the quote unquote first edition of Vinny a Love Letter. Right. And so some, some people want to buy the second one, even if they have the first one, which I think is awesome. Uh, so we're going to drop that hopefully in mid-February, as well as we're going to be dropping the audio book, Vinny a Love Letter, which a lot of people have been asking for. I'm not reading it. 
my dear friend, uh, Mr. Amon Ra, who is a love that guy. Yeah, celebrated poet in San Diego who now lives in North Carolina because that's where he's from. He actually is the one who is reading the book. So he's reading the book. I wanted a different voice, but I wanted a poetic voice and I wanted a voice I could trust. So Ra is doing that for me right now. So in February, the audiobook should drop. The second edition of Vinny should drop. So feel free to support that at rprestonclark.com. That is rprestonclark.com. Feel free to check that out. And I also still have the limited edition hoodies uh, still available. It's it's a hoodie that has artwork from page 180 and 181 of Vinny a Love Letter. And so a wonderful artist in Chicago was able to, to bring to life that section of the book uh, and we put, we put it on the front of the hoodie, so that's out as well. So yeah, I'm just you know I'm still living off off of Vinny in a lot of ways. And we are um, too. We are too, brother. Yeah, yeah. The creation of that character has completely Man. changed my life in so many ways. So and oh, and, and Terrell, well, a lot of people don't know Vinny was a character in a previously written screenplay of mine. Really? Yeah, he it was a screenplay called Play Clothes that I wrote in that program at UCLA, but he was a secondary character in that screenplay. But I all but he was my favorite character. And so I always wanted to do something with him on his own. And I originally thought it was gonna be another screenplay. But when I got the opportunity to write for my friend's website, I took him out of that screenplay, fleshed out his story, and you know, wow. rest is history. That's, that's amazing. That's pretty dope. I didn't yeah. even know that. Like the things that you learn. Man. Yeah. Ronald Preston <laughs> Clark, ladies and gentlemen, man, it's been a pleasure. We could do this all day. Yeah. Really good. <laughs> I, 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 I try to keep my podcast at a, at a, at a reasonable drive length <laughs> as I'm a new yeah. being in the game. Yeah. 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 Gotta, be, gotta be able to get to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to end off with this. What books do you read? What, what you marinating with right now? Uh, get that to the people. Um, currently, I'm reading my Soul Affirmations, a toolkit for reflection and manifesting the light within by my boy Kariga Bailey. Nice, nice. It's just a book of affirmations. That's my small thing. I'm reading, and this is why I say diversity is key. So I'm reading the affirmations. I'm reading two magazines on Kobe. Uh One of them was his right after he retired. They did a whole whole issue on him. And then the one after he passed away. Uh And so uh, so I've been eating, I love eating off of Kobe's, Kobe's words and Michael Jordan's words. They were just determined at the highest of levels. And then I'm reading uh, Defining Moments in History by Dick Gregory. It also serves as my pseudo textbook for my class. Reading that. And then um, my current Baldwin is If Bill Street Could Talk. Yeah. So that's the literature that I'm kind of diving into right now. You got a nice palette there. Yeah. I mean, a very diverse palette. There's a lot of flavor on that plate. Because kids don't realize if you're reading magazines, even if it's a car magazine, fashion magazine, whatever it is that you're interested in, you're still reading. Like you're still reading. So don't make it seem as if because it's not a book that you're not reading. And I think we and I think us as educators and mentors, parents, counselors, we need to start letting our kids know that more often that you still are consuming words. You're still consuming literature, even if it's not in a traditional way. Absolutely. Well, Ronald Preston Clark, thank you again for coming through, my brother. Um, It even feels weird for me to say your whole name. (laughs) But I got to do it for the people. It's funny. Me, me, me. Yo, know, me, me, Jordan, because Jordan Jerome Harrison and Eric Morrison Smith, we always tease each other because we call each other the three A's because because all because all of us use all three. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you for coming time. on. This has been another yeah. episode of Rise Noise. Make sure I go check out my brother. Um, second book coming soon, and that's it. We out. <laughs>